Good afternoon. I know you all are so busy. Good afternoon. I love it. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm Teresa Holmes, club president. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Today's meeting is sponsored by Laura Gallagher and the Creative Company, as well as Regina Milner and RMM Enterprises. Our thanks to them for their support of today's luncheon. All right, our opening music will be facilitated in a little bit of a different way today. The piano's not working. So let's direct our attention to Dick Lovell, who will lead us in singing a cappella, You're a Grand Old Flag. And following, following Dick's music, uh, in, our guest will be introduced by Melanie Ramey. I think I, oh, there she is. I need your help. Well, I need lots of help. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? You're a grand old flag, you're a high flying flag, and forever in peace may you wave. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true under red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brag. Should all the acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on the grand old flag. Wow, good going. Well, we have a lot of guests today. And I think it's wonderful because there's so many of you back. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see our guests. So everybody be on your best behavior because maybe they'll come back and visit us again. Uh, I would ask them to stand when I call their names and we can recognize them as a group. Uh, let's see, the first is Mary Berryman Agard, uh, Kathleen Davey, Natalie Erdman, and they're all guests of the program committee. We have Bill Connors, who's a guest of Ron Luskin. We have Todd Bragy, who is a guest of Rick Kiley. We have Laurie Gage, who is a guest of Peter Gray. You know, this is interesting. I never knew some of these people had friends. <laughs> uh, anyway, John Gamet of Rebecca Paré, and Anna Induhio, and Anna is a Levy Scholar, and we are really happy to have her with us today because she is going to be smarter than you can imagine in about four years. Uh, we also have Tia Nelson, who is a guest of Alice Waller. We have Jessica Padgett, who is a guest of Laura Gallagher, who's one of our sponsors today. We have Megan Willela, who is a guest of Mary Wright. We have Cassidy Wandenweiler, who is a guest of Tara Grace. And then we have Jason Anderson, who is a guest of Steve Goldberg. So give them a very warm welcome. Thank you, Melanie and Dick. On occasion, I'm going to ask us to recite the Rotary four-way test. So if we could stand, sorry, more movement, and start by reciting the four-way test together. First, is it the truth? <laughs> we should say this a bit more often, right? All right, let's start over. All right, let's go. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all those concerned? Thank you. <laughs> so last year was, will it be fun? This year, we're putting a little bit of a different lens on it. So I'd like to, um, to note that you know we've just reached the end of our Q1, per se, of our Rotary year. 
with um, some indication of how the change has been impacting our members, our teams, and the staff. And so I'd like to suggest that as we evolve, remember um, on July 1st, that was my, uh, my a different word for change. But as we evolve, if the four-way test was misapplied, consider how it would affect how we connect, grow, and serve. Is a statement of truth not truthfully stated, a lie? Would fairness apply with a lens viewed only from the eye of the beholder have an unfavorable outcome? The pursuit of our own way will not produce good and can damage friendships. And outcomes can only be beneficial when the perspective of all really reflects all. All right. On with the program. Rob Stroud was our member development committee chair last year, and he has an award to present. Rob? Indeed I do. The club's uh, member recruitment committee encourages all of us to think about individuals in our circle of friends, work colleagues, family members, and anyone else who would make a good addition to our Rotary Club. The committee created an award several years ago to recognize a member who is excelling at sponsoring new members into our club, since this is the key to maintaining the size and strength of our club. The award is named the Mitch Javid Award to honor a distinguished member who holds the club record for sponsoring the highest number of new members. Since 2014, we annually recognize the member who has served as the primary sponsor to the most new members for the last three years who have remained in our club. For those who don't know Mitch Javid, for which the award is named, Mitch has been in our club since 1968 and has sponsored 56 members and co-sponsored another 10. This distinguished and very busy member who was chairman of the UW Department of Neurosurgery says, I love Rotary. It is very dear to me. I believe in it, and so I want to share it with other good people. Mitch received the first award in 2014. Melanie Ramey, Dora Zaninga, and I are past recipients, and Susan Schmitz has received the award three times. I'm pleased to announce, <laughs> is Susan here? Oh, she's probably out recruiting. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce this year's recipient, Ron Luskin. You want to stand, Ron? <laughs> Ron has been a member of our club since 2014. He was formerly with Meritor Foundation and currently does consulting work. Since joining, Ron has been active in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Ethics Symposium Program, Rotary Act, and Swarzynski Award Committees. He has also chaired our Vocational Opportunities Committee and is a mentor to one of our Rotary Scholars. Not coincidentally, Ron serves as our club's member recruitment officer this year and is working on a number of projects to encourage new members. Ron has served as the primary sponsor to eight new members since 2018. Jason Bologna, Sean Carney, Jeremiah Robinson, Jason Fields, Peter Gray, Kyle Nondorf, Rebecca Pear, and Sally Jo Spaney. Let's congratulate Ron on receiving this year's Mitch Javid Award. One closing comment, we encourage each of you to think about who might made a good addition to our Rotary Club. Maybe it's a coworker, a friend, or a neighbor. The process is easy. Invite a potential member to one of our Wednesday meetings. If the person is interested in joining, we have a new online form that is available on our website, or you can contact the Rotary office. If you have any questions about pros proposing a new member, Pat, Jane, and Sharon in the Rotary office are all more than happy to help. Ron, thank you again.
Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> and again, thank you, Ron. Will Margaret Murphy please stand? Good morning. I am pleased to announce that Margaret is rejoining our Rotary Club today. <laughs> Margaret is an industrial organizational consultant for the Fox Valley Media Group. She is a former Rotar Rotarian in Nina and was previously a member of our club in 2017, from 2017 to 2020. And we are definitely glad to have you back. She's being sponsored by Ellis Waller. And again, let's welcome Margaret to our club. <laughs> Past club president, Michelle McGrath, will be serving as our Rotary District 6250 governor in 2023-2024. Today, she is going to come up to the podium and tell us a little bit about an upcoming district event that we can all attend. Thank you, President Teresa, and good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It has been far too long. This past week, I'm going to start off this past week, I was in Houston, Texas, actually getting trained to be a district governor. And I just want to, so at this zone um, training, there's 12 different states and three countries I represented. And I just want to share with you all that I was so proud and grateful every time I stood up and said I was from Madison downtown. You do amazing things, are incredible community members, rock star humans. And I couldn't be more grateful to be a member of this club and be ambassador of this club. So thank you, first and foremost. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that when the district was looking for someone to lead Vibrant Club Workshop, that I raised my hand. So Rotarians, get ready to flip the switch and join us at the Vibrant Club Workshop next Wednesday, September 23rd at 6 p.m. So some of you might be asking, what even is Vibrant Club Workshop? Webster defines vibrancy as pulsating with life and vigor. Melanie Ramey, for example. As leaders, partners, and community members and Rotarians, there has never been a more important time to embrace the necessary steps to add vibrancy to our clubs, our organizations, as well as for our own lives. I don't know about you, but I certainly could use some inspiration and vibrancy these days. Now you ask, Michelle, who can attend this free, amazing event? Are you a member of the Pat Jenkins Fan Club? <laughs> you can attend. Do you actively participate in Whiskey Fellowship on designated days or not? You can attend. Are you breathing? Guess what? You all can attend. So get your phones out, grab out your flyers that are on your table, and mark your calendars. And even if you can't make it next Wednesday, you sign up and register and we'll send you a link and we'll, you'll get to watch it in the comfort of your own office or whenever you have time. So a um, couple quick things. The event will be hosted live in Madison from Pearson Studios, thanks to Pearson Engineering and Jason Barron and Brian Baskin. And uh, I don't know what fun they have up their sleeves, but I'm sure there's lots of it. And I mean, last night, for example, they had me indicated as Rob Stroud, and Rob Stroud has never looked so good. <laughs> I, I think he's saying something in the back there, but I can't hear it. Um, you can also, like I said, view it in your own home because it'll be virtual, and we'll, uh, we're also having watch parties. And our good friends at Godfrey and Khan will be hosting the watch party up here on the square, so you can register and be a part of that as well. The um, workshop will be kicked off by High Energy Speaker T Street, who you see on the, um, on the slide. And she has spoken to thousands across the country on diversity and inclusion, advocacy and leadership. She is uh, just a hoot, and you are going to have a lot of fun with her and be inspired. We will be joined also by various District 62 Rot 6250 Rotarians that will share their insight on service, membership, foundation, and public image. And there will be abundance of resources as well. So if you're looking for ways to create vibrancy in your own lives, in, as, in your Rotary life, as well as in your organization, please register and join us for Vibrant Club Workshop next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. 
I'm registered and plan to attend one of the watch parties. Mary Pat Williams chairs our Community Projects Committee, and she is going to tell us about some upcoming volunteer opportunities. Mary Pat. Well, thank you. And continuing on in the theme of connecting and serving, the Community Projects Committee wanted you to know about some excellent opportunities that are available. You all have um, information at your tables on the green flyer. But if we start in September, one of our com uh, committee members, Jenny Jeffries, had been in contact with um, the River Food P Pantry. I know a number of you know that organization, have partnered with them in the past. They were communicating with us that they really still have a dire need for volunteers to help serve their clients. So 10 days from today, on Saturday, September 25th, from 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning, they're in need of four Rotarians to serve together making sandwiches and snack bags. So you'll be done before the Badger game starts and those um, wonderful packages will be distributed that day to people uh, in the community. There are registration uh, guidelines with the um, River Food Pantry, so if you would contact me, my information is on your green sheet. I can get you the forms electronically that they need to do uh, their work for a safe environment for all the volunteers and the clients they serve. So hopefully we could have, you have more than four people help. Then moving on to October, we have had an opportunity to work with Porch Light for a number of years as well. Maggie Porter Kratz has uh, been in contact with Porch Light this year. Because of the huge success of Socktoberfest, they still have some socks from us from last year. So they indicated what would be really helpful this year is Soaptober. So they would like to get personal hygiene packages together. It could be regular size bars of soap or even better travel size bars of soap, shampoo, lotion, shaving cream, all the kinds of things that would really be helpful for someone who was finding themselves in the need of, of, of those kinds of products. Every single Wednesday in October, Maggie and other community project people will be outside these doors with bins and you can bring these items to us for collection. They can, you can bring items every single Wednesday. The kind of travel things you get in hotels are great, but if you haven't been traveling, Walmart, Walgreens, everybody has a great aisle of the kinds of things that are really in need. So we will collect all through the month of October. If it's not convenient for you to come with supplies to one of the meetings, you can also drop them off at the Rotary office during business hours. So that will, I think, be a great event. They're really excited to partner on something that they really need some help with. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is the environmental service days for Rotary. I know there's been some discussion on that. There's more information that will come. Jim Christensen from our group is working with Karen. They're solidifying some dates. So keep that in mind for another October event for volunteering. If we looked just a little bit ahead for a sneak peek into the holiday season, we hopefully again will be participating with the Goodman Community Center for the Thanksgiving basket uh, food collections. Last year, unfortunately, that couldn't happen, but they're hopeful that it will this year, and we have 10 volunteer spots reserved for that. We also hopefully will get some more information on Coats for Kids from Tim and on tree planting from Jim Christensen, uh, but those dates haven't been finalized. More information to come. And then as we come into the Christmas season, holiday season, there's lots of opportunities with Salvation Army, with Lucier, Goodman Center. Jenny Jeffries is coordinating with the Empty um, Stocking Club group. There will be at least 10 volunteer slots for that. So uh, what I ask is that you look through this sheet and try and find some time in your schedule where you can connect and work with fellow Rotarians and do good in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Pat. Rotarians, we know how to serve, right? Let's get in and meet the need. Yeah. All right, our Swarzynski Award reminder. 
Um, October is our deadline for nominations for this year's Swarzynski, Manfred Swarzynski Award for Humanitarian Service. And it's just 16 days away. October is coming quickly. We have nomination forms at the button box in the hallway, the button box table, and on our website. So you'll be sure to look at that information and get your nominations in the Rotary office by October 1st. Next week, October, September. <laughs> September 22nd, our luncheon meeting will be held at the Concourse Hotel, not at the Park Hotel. Next week's meeting will be held where? At the Concourse Hotel. So <laughs> that's next Wednesday at the Concourse Hotel. And actually, the office will basically put that information um, regarding the, the meeting change or the location change in the Friday email. Our favorite part outside of the speaker of the program, birthdays. We have birthdays to celebrate today with a bit of humor or wisdom that complements our Rotary mission. We also encourage Rotarians to make an age-appropriate gift to the Madison Rotary Foundation, rounded up to $100 for our club Synergy Scholarship Fund. If you are in the room today, Rotarian, when I call your name, please stand. September 12th, new member, Alan Klugman. September 13th, Tom Deshant. September 15th, Tammy Thayer. September 16th, Loie Badradin. September 16th, Mike Engelberger. September 17th, Jim Taylor, who shares, we are taught to remember our failures because presumably we learn from them. An alternative is to celebrate and remember our successes. We do not have to brag. The celebration can be simple and personal. An example is a chocolate malt when you finish a big project. I'm in for that. This gives double pleasure and reminds us we are not always a failure. Imagine the pleasure of donating to Rotary's Polio Plus effort. Thank you, Jim. September 18th, Nate Babel. September 18th, Aaron, remember Aaron Embury? September 18th, Majid Samadi, who has a cartoon he wants to share. We only live once, wrong. We only die once. We live every day. Thank you, Majid. We have lots to celebrate, even in this time. Thank you. Thanks to our celebrants for their contributions to the Madison Rotary Foundation. And if you remember, our piano's not working today. So Dick Lovell is going to do the birthday song a cappella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. All right, thank you, Dick. We had a few members in the news last week, um, just reminding you about that. And I'd like to mention that um, three of our past members of our club passed away recently. So Gail Langer, who passed away on September 2nd, Tom Roggetts, who passed away on September 3rd, and Norv Benhart, who passed away on September 12th. We extend our sympathies to those families. We have a few members in the news items. Colleen Kerr, who was quoted in an article about the Madison Metropolitan School District. And congratulations to our own Mary Ellen O'Brien. She's here. Back there, yeah, with the camera, who was recently elected as co-chair of the Dane County Delegation of the Wisconsin Conserva Conservation Congress and chair of the Statewide Environmental Committee. Awesome. <laughs> All right, now on to the program. We held our monthly board meeting on September 7th. So I encourage members to actually review those board minutes that we post in our member login tab of the club's website. We want to make sure that members are here, are still seeing the current board members. So um, we ask, actually ask one board member to introduce a speaker each month. This month, Mark Clear is actually making that introduction. Mark previously served 11 years on the Madison City Council and was the founder of three tech startups. 
He is currently a senior proposal writer for Task in Madison, and Mark is in his second of a two-year term on our board. I'll now turn the podium over to Mark, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, President Teresa, and welcome, Rotarians. Good to see you. Um, I think after I finish this introduction, I'm going to go have a chocolate malt. <laughs> Great accomplishment for me. Our speaker today is Alexis London, who has been the executive director of the Bayview Foundation since 2016. Bayview is one of Madison's oldest and most successful affordable housing communities that has been in existence for a half century. As executive director, Alexis ensures safe, affordable housing for the 102 families that live at Bayview and the delivery of a wide array of vital services at Bayview's community center. She is also leading a redevelopment project that will transform Bayview's aging townhouses and community center into a vibrant neighborhood that emphasizes social cohesion, mutual aid, sustainability, and community health. I bet we're going to hear a lot about that in a moment. We look forward to her presentation. And Lexus, we have made a contribution to the rodeo. Ro 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 I think I just forfeited my malt. <laughs> the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund. You'll have to make your own rodeo contributions. Uh, as a way to say thanks for speaking to us today, and I also want to mention we will have a Q&A with our speaker at the end as time allows. Wait for the microphone, and you know the rule, don't touch the microphone. Only talk into the microphone. <laughs> Let's welcome Alexis London to our podium. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting Bayview to be here today. We are just so thankful for the opportunity to tell you more about Bayview, um, our past, our current present, and the future that we're planning. And it's a really exciting future. Um, and some of you may have been hearing about it in the news recently because it's been in the press quite a bit. Um, I must admit, I'm a little nervous to be here today um, in, in front of all of these Rotarians. Uh, Downtown Rotary has done such incredible work in Madison for so many years, and you're really kind of the, the leaders in change making in Madison, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and answer questions about Bayview's project later on. Um, at this time, I take heart in the fact that all of us in this room share a common purpose. The Rotary International vision statement reads, Together, we see a where, world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. That could also be Bayview's motto. Throughout our 50-year history, Bayview has been oriented around the following values. Inclusion, collaboration, a respect for diverse cultures, and a dedication to transforming lives and helping to create a more equitable Madison. We are now engaged in expanding Bayview, our facilities, our programs, and our services, so that Bayview is as strong 50 years from now as we are today. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey of Bayview and talk about our history, who we are today, and what we see in the years ahead. I'm going to introduce you to some of Bayview's residents, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about their deep engagement in reshaping Try this one. Here you go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll introduce you to some of our residents um, and also talk about how they were really deeply involved and instrumental in making the plans for the future Bayview, which is one of the things we're just so excited about in terms of the redevelopment project. Um, I really hope that this talk today will inspire you to learn more about our work 
and how it positively impacts the city of Madison and is really creating a more equitable community for everyone so that everyone in our community, no matter what their background or economic status, can thrive. Let's begin with a little bit of a geography lesson. And we've got some slides um, over on, the, on the, the, the screens for you to take a look at. Um, so history. Um, we'll begin with geography, because for Bayview, geography has been a really critical part of our history. And it's a huge part of our destiny. Bayview's housing, community center, gardens, and grounds are located in the triangle created by West Washington, Regent, and South Park Streets near Madison's downtown. We're just about a four minute drive away from here. We are in what is considered the Greenbush neighborhood, um, the area between West Washington and Monona Bay that was dredged and filled in the late 1880s. The triangle itself was a marshy area that was filled in with the ashes and trash at the turn of the century. The neighborhood was platted in the early 1900s. The green bush grew quickly into a diverse and densely populated area of single family homes, three flats, churches, and family owned businesses. The residents were largely, largely lower income and primarily of Italian, Albanian, Jewish, and African American descent. Oral histories recount Greenbush as a vibrant place and an extremely tight-knit community. No doubt it was. There is also no doubt that the housing was largely substandard and that discrimination and disenfranchisement created conditions that needed to be improved. Today, we know that redevelopment ought to be something done with communities rather than to them. We know, as Madison historian, author, and Rotarian, Stuart Levitin has said, that you can separate the culture of a community from the quality of its housing, and you can improve, that, I'm sorry, that you can separate the culture of a community from the quality of housing, and you can improve the latter while respecting the former. But what happened in the green bush was the worst of urban renewal. The neighborhood was raised, not rebuilt, and its residents were displaced. From the late 50s and throughout the 60s and 70s, the future of the green bush was determined with little respect for the cultures that existed in that neighborhood and little regard for the people who lived there. There, are some, there was some citizen opposition in the early 60s to the unilateral plans to destroy the green bush. And in 1966, out of that advocacy, the Bayview Foundation was formed. Our founders pooled seed money obtained federal funds, and worked with the city to earmark the triangle for affordable housing. And in 1971, they built 102 units of housing as part of that vision. Fast forward to 2021, Bayview today. And this is, this is what the housing and the community center um, that are located on about 6.4 acres looks like right now. Um, so for over 50 years now, since 1971, Bayview has quietly and effectively been providing safe, affordable housing and a broad array of services to a diverse community of families, individuals, children, and seniors. Our combination of housing combined with vital services helps end inter intergenerational poverty, ensures that children succeed in school, allows seniors to age in place, and creates a stronger, more equitable Madison. How do we do it? The Bayview model recognizes that it is this combination of services, affordable housing, plus vital services, and a broad array of them that are necessary in order to create the foundation that families need in order to thrive and move out of, out of poverty. Let's first talk about the first part of this equation, which is the housing. The slide here shows a representation of our current housing that was built in 1971 and has served multiple generations of Bayview residents. And we're going to take a look at some of the images of Bayview residents now. And as, as there's so many children who live at Bayview and families from all different backgrounds. Um, but the, 
and they're thriving. They're doing. They're they're wonderful. It's a vibrant community, um, but the buildings are really at the end of their functional lifespan, and it was neither cost effective nor possible to repair them. So we are rebuilding all new housing as part of a fifty million dollar redevelopment project. Yay! <laughs> Um, I'm excited to share. This is the first building that's going to go up. This will be at the corner of West Washington and Regent Streets. And you'll see there's a hole in the ground now, so it's already underway. Um, but the new housing on our campus will feature a 48-unit, four-story apartment building, a 25-unit, three-story apartment building, and 57 two-story townhouses. All of the units will have well-designed floor plans with great storage and air conditioning and several other amenities that residents are <laughs> really looking forward to. Nearly all of the units will be fully accessible to seniors and people with disabilities so that there is no issue about whether people can age in place at the new Bayview. And sustainability features will lower utility bills, reduce emissions, and enhance indoor air quality. That's something that we really are super proud of and is incredibly unique with a low-income housing tax credit project. Um, and the, the slide here is representative of uh, seven townhouse units that will be certified passive house. Um, the community center in the background will also be certified passive house. So with the new housing, it is going to allow us to create additional units to serve more low-income residents. We're actually going to be serving 80% more residents in the new Bayview, going from approximately 277 current residents to 500. And the number of children at Bayview will double. So we, thankfully, will have more room for families like the Carrera family, who I'm introducing you to now. Um, Jose and Amelia, the parents, have lived at Bayview for over 30 years. Jose originally grew up in Nicaragua, and he fled the war and violence of that country in the late 80s. He arrived in Madison at Bayview in 1988, met Amelia, who had left Mexico for a better life. And together, they're raising four beautiful daughters. Um, as Jose says in a recent interview, my daughters can play outside without fear of violence or suffering, and they have the opportunity to get a good education and pursue, pursue a career of their choice. I'm happy to say that the three older children are all part of Bayview's daily after-school programming as well. And Amelia was uh, critically inv involved in the creation of Bayview's mosaic mural called La Mariposa de la Vida, the butterfly of life. Um, Amelia has also shared that she's so excited about the redevelopment. And the good news is, is that it's actually happening. Um, Bayview has secured all of the necessary funding for the housing. And just a couple of weeks ago, as I mentioned early, we started construction. The role of safe, affordable housing in lifting people out of poverty is well documented. At Bayview, the vast majority of residents make, uh, pay only 30% of their income on rent. Why is that important? Households overburdened with rent, meaning they only, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on rent, have difficulty affording the other necessities in life, such as food, clothing, medical costs, transportation, utility bills. They cannot save for their future. They cannot fully participate in the economy. Quality housing at affordable prices, like at Bayview, means for residents they can focus on the things that really matter to them, health, education, their careers, their children's futures, and they can create a brighter future for themselves and a stronger Madison. Now we're going to turn to the other key ingredient, the Bayview's Community Center. Bayview's Community Center provides the vital services that people who live at Bayview and in the surrounding neighborhood need to thrive and prosper. The wide array of services that we offer includes food access. We actually participate in Goodman's Turkey Drive every year. Uh, the Rotary, Downtown Rotary, has supported many of our programs over the years, so thank you for, for those contributions. Um, we also provide resource and referral, interpretation, 
out of school programming for youth, early childhood education, adult education, English as a second language classes, and also physical wellness programs. Currently, we're really proud to share that 85% of the children who live at Bayview, there's about 125 of them currently, participate in our on-site programming. And so we get to see them five days a week, which is a treat, and support them with their, uh, through COVID with their virtual learning as well as during summer camps. Here are just some of the images of the kids at Bayview and some of the adults that participate in programming. Making services place-based has multiple advantages, reduces barriers to access to services, it can build on existing trusted relationships which increases participation, and of course it improves outcomes in health, education, and overall well-being. In a 74-page report entitled Housing as a Hub for Health, Community Service, and Upward Mobility, a well the well-regarded Brookings Institution presents compelling research and case studies showing the value of on-site services. As important as academic studies are, we have powerful evidence at Bayview. The success stories of children who have grown up at Bayview and have gone to do very important things. Take Roberto Rivera, for example. Roberto was a young child when he and his family moved to Bayview from Nicaragua. He earned his BA at UW-Madison and a master's degree at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's now the father of two boys and the executive director of a nonprofit serving youth organization in Chicago. He's also a sought after speaker and expert on youth development and leadership. There's also Jennifer Bauckham. She's one of three children who grew up in the Bauckham family at Bayview. Jennifer graduated from UW with a degree in botany and now is studying nursing at UW-Madison. In order to expand our reach and ensure we continue to create success stories like Roberto's and Jennifer's, our redevelopment includes a larger community center. The new, and this is an image of the new center, um, which is gonna be located in the heart of the redevelopment. The new center will double in size. It will include state-of-the-art classroom spaces, a commercial kitchen, a fitness area, an early childhood education space, a full food pantry, and a senior lounge, just to name a few of the amenities. The building is about 11,500 square feet, and as I mentioned earlier, will be certified passive house. Um, we're gonna be able to serve twice as many residents and people who live in the neighborhood um, that we that over that we currently serve and we're going to be able to add programs and services and we're really excited about the opportunity to better serve individuals who live at CDA housing which is our neighbor on the triangle there's over 400 residents who currently live there and that number will continue to go over the years of, as they redevelop um, and so we'll be able to serve them better which we're excited about the center, along with the expanded gardens, public spaces, and other sustainability features, have a price tag of about $9 million, of which we've raised more than half. Fine, yeah, that's really exciting too. <laughs> Finally, let me tell you about one other key element of our redevelopment. I mentioned before that redevelopment should be so something that is done with communities, not to them. Throughout our redevelopment process, we put uh, that philosophy into action by involving Bayview residents in envisioning, planning, and driving the changes that we are making. Currently, 277 residents reside at Bayview. They come from all over the world, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Nicaragua, Mexico, Ivory Coast, just to name a few of the countries. Many came here as refugees and immigrants seeking a safer, better life for themselves and their families. They know their lives and they know their needs the best. And as we designed our new campus, actually prior to its design, we held 25 focus groups in three different languages. We conducted door-to-door -door surveys and involved more than 70% of Bayview's residents. 
in the planning and envisioning of this new neighborhood. That included over 100 hours of community meetings. And we acted on what we learned. We acted on what mattered most to them. And here's some of what we heard. Residents need to feel safe, welcome, and included. Nature, gardens, and play spaces are nourishing and healing for all. Residents want to feel a sense of ownership and pride where they live. Color, art, and beauty are a necessary part of our daily lives and lift our spirits. People want, to feed, want and need intentionally designed spaces to gather, connect, and learn. We are so excited to be able to say that those values and ideas are now becoming a tangible reality in the new Bayview. We are so inspired by the residents and the families who've worked with us to create this uniquely effective and successful place that we call Bayview. And we are so grateful for the support of so many throughout Dane County whose generosity, curiosity, and belief in what we are doing and what more we can do guides us every day. And uh, you just saw sort of a collection of images, uh, renderings of the redevelopment plan. And you can see how those values are integrated in with the gardens. Uh, many of Re Bayview's residents are sustenance gardeners. Um, and there's adequate places for children to play and for people to connect with nature and connect with each other. So those are, that's sort of the reflection of that. Um, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and all that every one of you do to make Madison a stronger, more equitable city. We're really excited to be here and are thankful and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you for being here today. Uh, the number that you uh, threw out early on in your presentation was $50 million. That's a pretty big number. Could you explain perhaps the uh, funding model, the um, business model, how you're going to generate that money? Sure. So 41 of that, uh, about $44 million total is from low-income housing tax credits. 41 total, $41 million is going toward the housing, and then there's a small portion of that that's also going toward the new community center. And then Bayview's engaged in a capital campaign to raise the remaining dollars that are needed to finish the community center, some of the sustainability upgrades, um, gardens, and, and play spaces that, that you saw images of. Um, the low-income housing tax credit program is, is pretty competitive, and Bayview was awarded tax credits a year ago where it really enabled us to move forward with this project. Hi, uh, Jeremiah. Um, when you talk about how Greenbush demolition went sort of poorly and how Bayview has been such a great success, it makes me think about the uh, big uh, mobile home park behind the Lion Energy Center that it seems like at this point could go either way. Uh, as you know, people who are interested in our community, if we wanted to try to, you know, support the, the redevelopment of that area into something more like Bayview and less like what was done to Greenbush, how would we? How would you? Do you have any suggestions for the best way to support that? Um, I I would always start with the people who are who are inhabiting that space now, and and really listening deeply to them. Um, they know their stories and their lives and their needs the best. And so I would just start with really kind of slow um, conversations that are talking about what are your values, what do you need to thrive, what are you, what are your concerns, what are your hopes for the future. Um, those are the kinds of conversations, like really simple steps that Bayview did early on about three years ago with the Bayview residents. But you know we already had stability in the housing at Bayview and ha had trusted relationships. So. That took 40 years to build, um, and, and that there's a population there and other parts of the city that are really in need of that level of support and that level of listening. So that's where I would start and then just follow their lead. It might take a little bit more time, but it's I, totally well worth it. Thank you. Linda O'Hearn here. Oh, yeah. um, do you have, uh, will you be including any historic photographs or, or historic images of the old Greenbush neighborhood in this project? Uh, we have actually as part of the new community center, there's a, another part of our mission is art and culture. And so we're talking right now about how are we going to integrate that. We're planning to hire a consultant 
a placemaking and art consultant to help us think through not uh, historic pieces like that with historic artifacts and photographs and timelines to recognize this, this rich past because um, we think that that's absolutely necessary on the triangle, but also working with community residents and neighborhoods who live there today to kind of showcase the future of Bayview and even address um, social and political issues. And I, I want to just add, um, we, have, we did a design justice process for this redevelopment, so we integrated processes of um, really lifting up the voices of marginalized populations who typically haven't been involved in redevelopment planning and and so we we have a design justice case book that we've written and produced um, it's not on our website but if you email me I'm happy to email it to you so you can read if you're interested in reading sort of the step-by-step -step process that we took with design justice I'm happy to send it hi Alexis I'm Brian thank you for speaking today what is Bayview doing to address the need for affordable internet for its tenants oh good question so built into our plan. That's so necessary, especially with COVID. We learned how critical having reliable, um, healthy speed internet was for kids and schools and parents. So Bayview, Bayview actually integrated into our plans from the start free internet access for all of the families. So all of the units will be hardwired for internet access and we're actually in conversations with a couple different providers about how to actually, how to make that um, wireless and not uh, fully hardwired, but we're, we're, we're paying for the operations of that and, and the infrastructure of it. Hi, over here. Oh, hey, Hi. oh, Hi. I think that I mentioned you in yeah, this well, in my spot. I know, you must have suspected I was coming. <laughs> First of all, congratulations and, and thanks for citing me. Uh, one of the big problems of the original triangle was the absolute dislocation in, between mm. tearing down the houses and constructing new uh, residences. What is the coordination going to be between the new construction and moving people from the existing and then replacing their housing? Really good question. Um, so one of the guarantees that Bayview made when we started this project, we made several guarantees to residents. One, they'd be involved in the planning process. Two, um, they would not be displaced. Um, and so we've crafted a very complicated plan to first build the building. So we're building the 48 unit building on a part of our site that there is nothing on. So that will be built first. Then we're moving um, 44 households that will then reside in the 48 unit building, then tearing down their current townhouses and then that actually, that sort of a plan goes on for three years. So the entire reconstruction of Bayview will end in 2024. Um, and the plan is for nobody to be displaced and to lose housing and to be pushed off the triangle. I, I have three questions, actually. Can you tell us uh, the size of the units, how many bedroom, the range of bedroom uh, availability? How does a potential resident find you? And are the community gardens a common or are they private? Oh, yeah. So um, the units themselves will be one, two, and three bedroom units. Currently, we only have two and three bedroom units that are, have two internal staircases, so they're not at all accessible. So seniors who are currently overhoused in a two or three bedroom unit will be able to be moved to an accessible one bedroom unit, which then opens up two and three bedroom units for larger families. And so that's why you're seeing this big 80% increase in the number of people served. Um, so, so there'll be one, twos, and threes. The majority are three. What Madison desperately needs right now, desperately needs right now, is actually affordable housing for families with children, and that's why that community center service model is just so critical and so successful here. Um, and so, individuals who are interested in living at Bayview, um, currently we have 102 people li households living there. None of them, as far as we know, are planning to leave. Um, people love living at Bayview. Um, and so uh, we're going to first accommodate them, and then uh, we'll have 28 additional units, and then there's a waitlist process. The waitlist opens up probably again in March. Um, and then we'll also at the same time be marketing to all potential um, people who need housing 
we'll market the units to those people. We're first going to be working with um, Dane County and the city of Madison on the, really looking at people in desperate need of housing who are already on the homelessness um, consolidated list that, that the county and the city work on together. So priority will be given to families really in desperate need of housing. Um, and the third question was the gardens. Um, so there'll be 30 10 by 10 put, foot plots in addition to people, residents having their own plot in front of their unit. Bayview believes that people have the right and the, they get so much joy out of like creating their own gardens and planting what's in front of their units. And so that will be um, definitely appreciated and continued with the new Bayview. Um, and so the 30 plots will be similar to community plots that um, are uh, throughout the city, neighborhood gardens. And so there'll be like a lottery system and then families will be eligible to put their, their family in that and then secure a spot for as long as they're gardening. Yeah, thank you so much, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Alexis. We really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you for being here today, you and your team. Well, Terrians, we're adjourned. <laughs>